even in the moment, it doesn't appear to be so. And violence is regressive, non-efficacious, even if in the moment it looks to be working quite well. Thank you. Right? And it's not hard to imagine everyone in this room knows complete with, has complete clarity about the fact that on occasions, in certain instances, violence solves a problem. You know, it just does. And it looks like the way to solve that problem and the only way to solve the problem and we're damn glad that problem got solved. You know, th this is obvious. But for people who agree with Gandhi, there's something illusory about that. It's not the way the universe is uh, put together in the long run. John Howard Yoder, to use him again, says that to practice violence is to go against the grain of the universe. You know, and you can do that, but in the long run, nonviolence, peace, justice in its fullness brought about nonviolently, that's where we're going. <laughs> That's where the universe is going. And so it just makes more sense to get with the grain of the universe sooner rather than later, right? And so Gandhi, Yoder, people like this, both of the secular and the non-secular variety, have, have this kind of view. Now, as I said uh, when I began my remarks, it's a commonplace and it's an understandable commonplace to see human history as a history of conflict and, and violence. And to abstract from that observation the idea that nonviolence just doesn't work. It might work on occasion here or there, but in hard cases, when you have to stop a totalitarian, uh, brutal regime, a murderous uh, clan, you know, a, a military a leader, a, a murderous force, uh, under some uh, circumstances, uh, nonviolence simply does not work. Whereas for all of its problems, violence does. That's, a, that's the ordinary human view held by nearly all people. And uh, it has the uh, virtue of being simple. And it, and it has the virtue of being uh, uh, the appearance of uh, it has the appearance of self-evidence, almost, you know. But in fact, nonviolence often does work. Uh, and uh, for example, if you read uh, Duval and Ackerman, as I mentioned moments ago, you'll find many cases where they're where it's worked. If you read Shell, you'll find many cases where it's worked. And so I don't only mean, if you took me to mean earlier, that I was talking about nonviolence works in interpersonal relationships and, you know, in Canada and the United States uh, have a trade disagreement and so on. If that's what you took me to mean, I mean something far more demanding than that. I mean to say that in the most demanding, most gruesome, most difficult, most bloody kinds of circumstances, nonviolence has a history of working. And uh, so, uh, I've, you know, you have texts I've already given you if you want to look at examples and so on. And uh, I'll say, I guess, two things. One is um, I'll make a very brief uh, comment about uh, a Christian nonviolence, uh, which is the kind of nonviolence I know best, and then, and then, a, and then a comment about democracy and nonviolence. Um, and then, and then I'll answer questions, and we can we can just talk. Um, whereas, of course, there are non-faith-based theories, ver versions, and, and practices in communities of, of nonviolence. I 
I, I, I don't think they're robust and I don't think they're very efficacious and I'm pessimistic about their power um, to change the world. And uh, I, do, I don't understand them deeply and uh, I don't think even their advocates have a lot of faith when it comes right down to it in their own words, just to be blunt. On the other hand, uh, there are uh, many thousands of people who out of the very fiber of their being, out of the very depth of their um, innermost self, um, have the deepest conviction about the absolute uh, moral truth and uh, purpose and necessity of nonviolence, who are quite willing to, to lose their lives in its practice. 